Uh, Mora is zooming in from Costa Rica, so we're really happy that she took the time. And I'll go forward with the introduction. Mora Stevens has been an independent journalist since 1997. After serving time in the mainstream corporate run media at two well respected magazines, she is also a university and public educator and lifelong grassroots peace, justice, and environmental climate activist. She has written hundreds of stories, white papers, articles, studies, educational materials, and even a few laws. She co founded Frackbusters and the Coalition to Protect New York as well as the Citizen Journalism Project, which helped communities around the country fight fracking and related corporate harms. Mora currently is on the coordinating committee and editorial team of the Eco-Socialist Network, System Change, Not Climate Change, where since spring of 2020, she has co-hosted a number of webinars on topics of broad interest to eco-socialists and those environmentalists slash social justice activists who don't yet realize that they're eco-socialists. So Maura, with that, I'll let you go forward with using media for good. Thank you, Will. Thanks very much. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I want to start out by giving you an idea of where I'm coming from and how my personal journey has informed what I'll be talking about today. I started working in journalism about 40 years ago. Of course, I was a little kid then. Um, I stumbled into a job with what was then the, the very well-respected weekly news magazine. I started as a researcher and moved up through the ranks to be a, a reporter, a writer, and eventually a general editor in the international editions. I was surrounded at that time by scrupulously ethical, probing, caring, careful professionals from whom I learned a lot. But over the years, I became increasingly disillusioned. At first, we also had a strong union and we enjoyed what felt like job security in a company that touted its ethics as well as its friendly atmosphere and generous benefits. But editorial decisions began taking a back seat to advertiser pressure. I won't go into the series of disappointments, but I quit twice in protest of these decisions that were so corporate friendly. And twice I was lured back by promises that were never even pretended to be kept. I finally left for good the third time I quit. And I've never looked back, even though the next regular paycheck I was able to land was only 32% of my prior salary and the highest salary I've been able to achieve ever since then is only 75% of my 1997 earnings. But I've been able to live with myself ever since and feel good about my contributions to society. I'm going to start my, um, my slide presentation here. So give me a second to make sure I'm getting it going properly. And here we go. Um, excuse me, here we go. Okay. So today, I'm proud to call myself a journalist and activist or a jacktivist, following in my own small way in the great tradition of such leaders as Ida B. Wells, I.F. Stone, Upton Sinclair, and today's luminaries such as Amy Goodman, Laura Flanders, Janine Jackson, Dar Jamal, Naomi Klein, Greg Palast, David Sirota, and the late great news dissector, Danny Schechter, among others. Now, if you don't recognize those names, it's not very surprising, but more on that later. So I came from inside corporate media and watched it go downhill. And I've watched the demise of daily local newspapers and often all local news coverage, which has been devastating to communities and diminishing to journalism as a profession on the national and international level. I've been writing a book called The Five Noble Professions and How to Save Them. I usually make people guess what they are, but for the sake of brevity today, I'll give you a big hint. One is journalist. But journalism has been so subverted that a majority of respondents to a recent Gallup poll lumps the profession among the worst, right down there with members of Congress, lawyers, business executives, lobbyists, and car salesmen. That's well-deserved in my opinion. It's the journalist's job to dig for the truth and present it to the public. I believe that role must be expanded if we're ever to win the kind of world we want. Journalists can't be mere passive reporters of he said this, he said that. 
and I say he deliberately twice. Good journalists don't present two sides of a picture, nor do they do what all five major Sunday news shows from ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox, and NBC did in 2020 in failing to even talk about the climate crisis. It was astonishing. ABC's This Week, CBS's Face the Nation, and NBC's Meet the Press didn't ask a single question that mentioned the climate crisis. <laughs> Not until September 13th, when wildfires devastated the West Coast. Face the Nation asked only two questions referencing the climate crisis in the entire year. What all this means is that we have to fight on a number of fronts to restore journalism's, journalism's nobility and usefulness, because without a robust, diverse, and unfettered media sector, we'll never achieve a just, equitable society. And we also have to become the media ourselves in many ways. I won't have time in this short time span to go into much depth here, but I hope we'll cover some good ground in the q and I wanna clarify some terminology, terminology. Let's not use terms like fake news or alternative facts, which came compliments of the prior tweeter in chief. There's no such thing as fake news. There's news, which is based in verified and verifiable facts. There are opinions, either fact-fueled or pulled out of a hat or a tweet, and there are complete fabrications or lies. We're too prone to using euphemisms. Lies are picked up and then repeated until they become part of the so-called collective knowledge base. When we see or hear lies in news media or social media posts, Let's call them what they are, lies. No matter how high the perpetrator's position of power, let's use these actual terms, lies and hoaxes, and let's call those who spread them liars. Let's not buy into the framing. There are hoaxes galore for sure, and it's hard to tell sometimes, especially because we're all so busy and simply bombarded with the information and advertisements. But we really have to take the time to question everything and take nothing for granted because these lies can cause grievous harm and have done so. Media literacy, the ability to distinguish between good information and hoaxes is hard to teach when young people think there's not much of anything trustworthy and who can blame them? Furthermore, our civil safeguards and social safety nets have been systematically weakened. So we're busy trying to keep ourselves and our families afloat. Plus our attention is being divided over too many things. We wanna show our friends and contacts that we're up to the minute on topics that we're mutually interested in. So we sometimes just hit share before we even read past the headline or consider the source. Even people in tremendous uh, positions of power do this. So it's no surprise many members of the public think that it's okay. But especially with unfolding stories, we need to take time before jumping in and passing along every new tidbit that's circulating. It could be months or years before the whole story even comes to light. Let's not be part of the disinformation machine ourselves. While we have a whole lot of social media, the main media landscape is dominated by fewer corporate entities than ever. I gave a talk on so-called fake news four years ago, and four of these six were different then. There have been so many mergers and takeovers in the media industries that it's just impossible to keep up. That's an area for activism we can talk about later if you like. But we don't have to pay attention to these and other corporate controlled media. The vast majority of people are completely unaware of just how many excellent independent non-corporate based media we do have. Oops. I'm seem to have lost my slide place here. There we go. Sorry about that. There are actually a lot more of these uncorrupted media than there are corporate media. They're generally run by scrappy entrepreneurial journalists who are in the profession because they believe in a society that has an informed public that does not meekly obey whatever the government and the corporate elite tell them to believe. We need to seek out such sources of adversarial journalism that don't kowtow to government or corporate elites, that question authority and challenge statements made by liars. Pick one or two of these and use them as your primary sources. 
Scientists from Shell Oil and other fossil fuel corporations knew that climate change was a big threat in the 1970s, but the industry conspired to suppress the information. The tactic was similar to those of the tobacco industry earlier. Cast doubt on the science and pay so-called experts to go on as many media as possible to support this doubt. It's sickening and should be criminal. People were dying because of these ads. But that was then and this is now. It's not just ads that are to blame for deaths and human suffering. Millions of people have died and been displaced in part because of negligence or worse on the part of news corporations such as the New York Times, Washington Post, and many other US, UK, and Australian media. These stories can be directly traced to the deaths and displacements of millions of people in Iraq and in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, the Palestinian occupied territories and elsewhere. And it's not just Republican leaders who, do, to, who are to blame either. About 69% of US adults use Facebook and about three quarters of those access it daily. <laughs> it's pretty shocking. And in the US, uh, the U United States is only about 10% of all the users. The rest of the world is even more addicted. For example, almost everyone in the United Arab, Arab Emirates uses social me media. Um, and Facebook's global reach is just under 3 billion people. More than a billion use Instagram. A study by researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Media Lab published in Science Magazine, studied rumors <laughs> that were spread on Twitter from 2006 to 2017. So this is five years old now, and it's probably much worse in 2022. About 126,000 rumors were spread by about 3 million people. The scariest thing about this was that hoaxes reached more people than true stories that were shared. The top 1% of hoaxes were sent to between 1,000 and 100,000 people each, but the truth rarely reached more than 1,000 people. Falsehood also diffused faster than the truth. So now that we've gotten through all the depressing stuff, let's turn to the positive and talk about how we can protect ourselves and young people especially from falling prey to these lies. I want to mention here that the worst offenders in the dissemination of lies are generally adults, not teens. So let's, let's be sure that we understand that adults are as much to blame, if not more, than teens. And if you've been watching over the past few years, the young leaders of various new organizations um, are articulate, informed, and passionate and they're digital natives. They've come of age knowing how to use computers and mobile phones and how to navigate the vast placenta of information into which they were born. And we can hope they're not so easily duped as their elders have been. So, okay, now what can we do? Number one, to quote the muckraking 20th century journalist, George Seldes, question everything, take nothing for granted. Media literacy is not just an academic term, it's a critical tool for survival, more so every day. We can't rely on the media to send us truthful, fact-based information. We have to seek it out ourselves. And that means being smart about how we access it and, how, and aware of what we give up in doing so. Number two, stop using social media as your primary source for news if you're doing that. Facebook and Twitter and Google and Amazon and their wannabes are evil empires. They're mining every bit of information about you that they can and selling it to other corporations, but we're still using them. Keep the post office in business. Write letters and cards. People will love you for it. Even now, when we really need to support the post office as it's under attack by pretty much everybody. So another really important thing is to learn to use Citizens Band or amateur radio, also known as ham radio. You don't need a license for this. It's a critical communication tool during crises, which includes such things as government or corporate shutdowns of telecommunications. This actually happened in San Francisco in 2011 when BART officials cut off cell service for passengers because of protests against the fatal shooting of Charles Blair Hill by BART police. 
There are actually a lot of amateur radio operating um, society groups around the country. In my experience, these folks are incredibly helpful and eager to share knowledge with newcomers. You'd wanna look at them carefully first and be sure they're not a bunch of isolationist militia members. But again, I've had good experiences with several groups, some of whom used to come to introduce my journalism students to using radio for communicating. There will come a time when we cannot rely on social media, when the government, military, or a disaster will shut down our telecommunications completely. We have to know how to conduct rescues, engage in mutual aid, organize and strategize without these untrustworthy tools on which we've come to rely so heavily. So it's obviously not yet possible to completely escape social media, but I strongly recommend that you use it as minimally as you can for community-based activities. Don't share anything private on it and ignore the so-called news on it unless you can verify its source. And absolutely, don't let it be your only source of information or of communication in general. The same with corporate-run browsers. Ditch them. I recommend for starters that you stop using Safari, Google Chrome, Microsoft Explorer, and other corporate-run search engines. There are several fabulous independent search engines that protect your privacy and are actually better in delivering search responses. They're not paid to boost particular corporate products, so you're more likely to get accurate results, even while you're protecting your privacy and that of your friends and contacts. I happen to use Firefox and DuckDuckGo, but there are several others out there. And no more Google. Let's never use Google as a verb. Use web search. It's the same number of syllables. Let's not use Google at all or as little as possible. I know it's almost impossible to escape it. Every time you use a search engine, Google, Yahoo, et cetera, or a social media site, you're being tracked. Amazon especially, as well as other online merchants also track you. Whatever you do online is being recorded. All your search data, everything you do while your computer is connected to the internet. Your IP address is captured, cookies are left on your machine to record what you searched for, what day and time you visited, what you linked to from that site. That info is then stored. They know your household makeup, your friends and family, your political leanings, your bra size, your leisure and work interests, your medical history, and everything with which you've been connected online. You may not think this is such a big deal, but these companies then sell your info to other companies who target you with these so-called personalized ads, which of course many of us enjoy. But not only advertising, but fake news can be directed at you too, and often is. You've probably noticed if you use Facebook that media organizations as well as retailers are targeting, targeting you based on your recent activity online. And well, the best place to learn about privacy is via the Electronic Frontier Foundation. I urge everybody to get to know it. And let's recognize that media includes such things as billboards, food labels, textbooks, clothing labels, and advertising of all kinds. Number six, check the facts. If you're faced with a claim that has no evidence, assume it's bunk. Don't believe it and don't share it. If you find it is bunk, call out the liar. Don't just let it pass by. Tell your friends about the lies you suspect or find. It takes a little time, but it's instructive and you may gain one more ally in the search for reliable information. Otherwise, first consider the source. If you see numerous shares of a particular story, find the original, excuse me. If it's legit, it will say reprinted from XXX source. Go to the first one. See who's the producer or the publisher. If it's a political or affinity based entity, find out where the funding is coming from. Always follow the money and always check the references cited. Don't assume that the New York Times or the Washington Post or Newsweek or PBS or NPR are any better than the other sources either. All of those are corporate entities beholden to stockholders and or corporate lenders and funders. If the sources in the story are all government, military, or corporate, and it ends with something that's supposed to balance it out, like critics say this could cause problems for the community, or environmentalists worry that the compressor station could leak gas and cause health problems, 
then you know it's biased toward the government or the corporate entity. Snopes is a reliable fact-checking fact source, as, and the last time I checked, factcheck.org is. I used to tout Wikipedia, but as you see here, it has some scary backers. Google was the biggest funder in 2020, along with the Wojcicki Foundation, the YouTube Foundation. <clears throat> Other major donors you see here include Amazon, George Soros, Facebook. So an interesting aside on that is that Wikipedia spends $55 million a year on salaries and programs with a total of $112 million in expenses in 2020, while all content is user generated that is free to Wikipedia. That's a good lesson to myself even. Like Ben and Jerry's, leftists' favorite ice cream and any number of big green organizations, all entities are susceptible to the draw of capitalism. And it's hard to resist as my former students who've been ashamed to tell me that they've had to resort to working for the US military, the World Bank, and big marketing firms, and even an oil company will attest. They have to pay their student debts after all. Number seven, be the media yourself. Oops, I don't have a slide for that. I'll skip ahead to support whistleblowers, learn about them, support whistleblowers and journalists under fire for exposing corruption, malfeasance, and crimes by the powerful. Number eight, be the media yourself, learn, train others. Emily Atkin, who publishes the newsletter Heated, heated.world, focusing on the climate crisis, took a huge leap and left her own secure jobs in organized media to go independent about two years ago. Heated is available on Substack, a place where freelancers can keep their news writing and raise money through subscriptions. She approaches the climate situation, as she says, as a quote, high stakes corruption, power, and disinformation story, end quote. Unlike mainstream media, which don't point big fingers at the real culprits, corporations, and their government colluders. Well, we can't all be like Emily, but we can engage with our local papers, even if they're shoppers or penny savers or the like. We can cultivate relationships with local reporters if we're lucky enough to live in a place with local reporters or with statewide uh, reporters at the Capitol. Um, and we can uh, cultivate relationships with writers and editors and producers on broader reach publications, podcasts, TV shows, and online venues. The more they hear from us, the more likely they are to possibly change their tune. I hope people will ask more about this in the Q&A. So use reliable independent media as your own news sources. That's the most important thing. If you don't have time to read, listen in the car, Get audio podcasts of democracy now, five days a week, and you'll be the smartest person you know. If you're not attuned to audio, pick one or two online sources and have them push headlines to you that you can read at your own pace. If you prefer to watch, stream them. One of my favorite podcasts is Richard D. Wolf's Economic Update. Professor Wolf was the very first guest at the beginning of the Root Cause lecture series last um, fall. And I've learned more about economics from him than I did during two semesters of economics in college. Of course, I was asleep during those, but he's a powerhouse of righteous, useful information. I have a number of links that I'll give to Will and Tyler to share on the YouTube page. And I invite anyone to email me to request a copy of my guide to actually using the media via writing letters to the editor, op-eds and media releases, among other things. Uh, among other tools that you can use. I, again, um, want to remind you to look up these, these, I'll have links for all of these in the, um, in the YouTube two page later as well. Please visit them, especially fair.org, which is fairness and accuracy in reporting, which was founded, um, oh dear, I think it just celebrated its 25th or 27th um, anniversary by the great media critic, Jeff Cohen, uh, with whom I was fortunate to work for six years at the Park Center for Independent Media. Janine Jackson and Jim Nurekis carry on the tradition of scru scrutinizing what's going on in corporate media and uh, bringing to our attention 
some of the malfeasance and the, the absolute crap that are being uh, published and produced in so-called um, news media, including some of the most respected ones like the Washington Post, the New York Times, NPR, etc. So please check out fair.org and support these people with your money and um, by sharing their real proper investigative journalism, which is what we need to have a just and equitable society. Thanks, and I look forward to your questions. And please do write me if you like. Great, thank you so much, Mara. And yes, for those of you out there watching virtually, feel free to chat in your questions. There were a few that came in just now, and I will read them off to you more. Question one, if you're ready. Sure, and if you don't so, mind, tell me, tell me the name of the person who put it in there, please, if you don't mind, and where they are, if they have that information is available. Sure, so this is from Tyler. This is an easy one for me. This is from Tyler, co-organizer. Um, he's in Northampton at the moment. And he asks, what do you make of the notion of objectivity in the media? Uh -huh. how, is it, how is it that so many of us associate the word objective with the center between contemporary US Democrats and contemporary US Republicans? Uh, with those media institutions being Fox News on the right, on the right, and then yeah, things like CNN on the left. This is an absurd ethnocentric belief. Where does it come from? Is it found elsewhere around the world or do global perspectives prevail? That's a wonderful question. That's, that's the whole section of my talk I cut out because I didn't think I, might, I would have room for it. So that's a great question, thanks. Um, objectivity is, is a ridiculous word to use in news. It's a kind of a ridiculous word to use, period. Um, and, and it's what is taught in journalism programs around the country right now and, and in North America, all throughout North America. Less so in other countries, although as usual, um, where the US is exporting its bad habits and other places are picking up on it. But in the department that I worked at, um, at, a, at a North American institution, I, uh, I'm gonna give an anecdote to illustrate and then I'll build on that, but I, went to a journalism faculty conference at one of the most respected other journalism institutions in the country. And um, during the coffee break, uh, I was talk chatting with six other faculty members from journalism programs. And I was wearing a name tag that said, Mara Stevens Park Center for Independent Media. And one of the others said to me, what's independent media? And I said, you know, not corporate tied media. And they looked at me, all of them looked at me blankly. And I said, um, truth out. Nobody knew what I was talking about. So I said, uh, in these times, LA Weekly, nothing, nothing, even from the West Coasters. And finally I said, oh, okay, here I am, I'm in New York. I'll say, city limits, nothing. Uh, democracy now, nothing. Nobody heard of Amy Goodman at this place. Uh, this, this is just seven years, this is seven years ago. So finally, I'm, I'm starting to panic. I'm thinking, oh my God, these are the people who are teaching my students. That's why that young woman came into my office last week, closed the door behind her and said to me, in all seriousness, can you give me some advice on what brand of cosmetics will make me look the most luminous on air? And so, you know, these are the people teaching the next generation of students. And finally, I'm just trying to pull out of my head some other names, you know, color lines, nothing, you know, black agenda report, nothing, nothing. Finally, I, 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 in desperation, I said, aha, I know one they've got to know. Yes, magazine, nothing. Ms. Magazine. Oh, one person had heard of Ms. Magazine. And the last thing I mentioned was Bill Moyers. And several people had heard of Bill Moyers. But these are the teachers of, our, of the people who are going into journalism now. Um, and, and that's, you know, uh, they are being taught that if you present two sides of the story, it's okay to have 12 military people talking about withdrawal from 
Afghanistan, for example. FAIR did a, a, a survey last August, three weeks in last August, of who was being interviewed on the five major um, TV Sunday uh, programs, news programs. And of the 22 people who were interviewed, 20 of them were directly tied to the military. One was a, uh, the former Afghan ambassador to the United Nations and one other was a non-US non American. So, and there were no people talking from the peace perspective, activist perspective, uh, on the ground working with human beings in Afghanistan. There was nothing like that. So this is what people are being taught is objective. If they, they speak to a wide variety of military people, that's objective. You know, they might have a minor difference, just like um, Tyler's question. The Republican and the Democrat might have minor differences about one or two things, but they really they find a common ground, and so therefore it's called bipartisan. That's nonsense. I mean, we're not hearing from the Kathy Kellys of the world, and um, you know, the the uh, uh, Norman Solomons and the people who are leading efforts uh, to win without war. David Swanson. There are so many wonderful activists working for peace, justice, environmental sensibility. Um, so everything is, is sort of, it, it's, to, you know, the students are told that this is objective. And frequently they'll do a 500 word story, 487 of those words will be about why fracking is good for a particular community and it's gonna bring jobs and benefits and, and economic boost to the community. And at the very end, it will say something like, some environmentalists, including Mary uh, Doe, are concerned about air quality. But, you know, there's not, and we're not concerned. Let's not use these words in our own press releases. We're not concerned. We're not worried. We're not vaguely anything. We're furious, terrified, frightened, you know, inflamed, radicalized, and not, we're not just worried and confused. So when we are our own media, we have to be careful not to fall into these traps of using such terms as the war in Iraq or natural gas, you know, with the invasion and occupation of Iraq, dangerous methane, leaking fracked gas. You know, it's not, it's not natural gas. The only natural place for it is deep underground. Um, we, we can't fall victim to these. We, we do, we do it all the time. I, um, I've even heard the great Amy Goodman, who's one of the you know, great journalists of our time, fall into the trap occasionally of using terms like that and, and buying into certain, um, even certain NGO um, claims that are, that are wrong about, for example, Nicaragua, but I don't wanna get into that too deeply. So I, I think it's, it's, it's a US phenomenon, but unfortunately it's being replicated around the world. Great, and there is another question here for you, Maura. Um, this one comes from Mary F. in the chat, and she says, we have to counter the information regarding the saber rattling going on regarding the Ukraine-Russia Ukraine conflict. Um, where slash how is it best to counter information? Um, I'm not sure what this stands for, but IOW be our own media. Um, in other words, in other, in other, words, in own other own. words, be our own media, uh, corporate media is pushing this uh, conflict pretty far. Yeah, and, and, and it, it does pay to push back on corporate media. Um, I, I, it really, it can pay. I can't say it always does, but it can occasionally pay. Um, and, and not only to the corporate media, but their advertisers. Um, a, a group that I was in, involved with some years ago had a, had a success, a pretty big success, when um, one of our uh, family members of one of our group came from out of town and ended up staying in a hotel. Uh, and in the hotel chain, it was a big chain, began with an H. It has a new, number of brands. Um, it, they, were, they were playing faux news in the lobby and it was, like in many airports, you are frequently bombarded with faux news and you don't have the option of getting away from it because you're sitting there in the lobby and it's on and you know, it's just, it's a bombardment. 
and we did a small letter writing campaign. I think there were there were 11 of us and we sent a total of 21 or 24 letters to the headquarters. And we, we sent it to all, every member of the boards of directors of that advertiser. And we told them that we would never patronize them. And we were, some of us were members of their um, frequent visitor club, said we'd never go, stay there again. That was our big threat. <laughs> and for those 21 or 24 letters, they stopped playing it. They stopped playing phone news in the lobbies of their hotels. Now, I don't know if that's gone back now, but that was seven or eight years ago and that worked. And it, it's, it's time consuming, it's a royal pain, but if you have a group already existing and a few of you are good writers, um, I've, I've done this with some of my groups, I've written five or six letters and I've distributed them to people and said, just pick one, change some words, add your own first sentence and send it off to the, I do all the research. I tell them who the directors are, who the CEO is, who the CFO is, et cetera. And they get letters from real people. You can do it with email too. Um, and now you can do it, Twitter storms. I mean, Twitter storms are really, can be really powerful if enough people are participating. Um, so I, I do encourage that. And I just encourage every time you see a lie, um, drop a letter to the editor. Very few um, major, publications anymore have ombuds people or public editors. The New York Times eliminated it it's about five years ago, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it, it is possible to make some dent in, in those. And more important, use your local media. If you're lucky enough to have a local independent radio station um, or a local independent weekly or an arts zine, or anything like that, find uh, a connection between the art and the, um, the issue at hand or the, the, the or, and, and whenever possible, peg it to a story that has appeared in that medium. So, uh, you know, say in your story published January 30th, 2022, you said this. However, the facts reveal that you, that's a lie. <laughs> that's a lie, or you used, bad sources. You know, you don't have to outright <clears throat> necessarily call them a liar, but you could say that's a lie or that's a fabrication or that's that's not true. Um, you know, I, I think shame, we we in the on the left have been too concerned with bringing real science to the forefront, bringing research data, mountains and mountains of data we have collected. I mean, we don't need any more damn science on climate change. We don't need any more science on rising fascism. We don't need any more studies to prove <clears throat> that racism is a scourge and sexism is on the rise. These are true, they're, they're verifiable. We don't have to keep defending ourselves with these statements. The, the left make, um, the, the right make absolutely preposterous lies all over the place. They get repeated and repeated and repeated and all of a sudden they become part of the collective consciousness. We need to start being a little bit more brutal ourselves. And this is what I, you know, I think is shocking for my students and colleagues to hear me saying this, but we have got to stop being so willing to tread lightly. We have to be more brutal. We are fighting for our lives. We're fighting for the lives of, you know, tens of millions of other people and other species that have no say in the matter. We can't <clears throat> keep playing nice guy. We have to not put the scientific headline on a story. We have to grab people's attention. We're not going to grab people's attention. We're fighting. We have to make things sexy. We have to make them seem exciting. And we, you know, use kittens if you have to, or baby goats or whatever the hell is going to grab people's attention. Um, because kittens and baby goats seem to be the most popular things on media, including in my own household. Um, but, you know, we have to stop being nice guys and we have to stop relying on um, absolute uh, gravity when we, when we write and do things. We have to play the same game because we, too much is at stake. Great. And another question, Mara. Um, so this kind of relates back to your slides, but 
This is also coming from Anna in Arlington, Massachusetts. And she asks um, about the dangers of Facebook, Twitter, now maybe even Spotify, banning those who speak what they label as disinformation. Um, and this often seems to be something that's championed by Democrats, congressional Democrats who want um, increased censorship from Facebook, uh, Google, and other institutions. Can you talk a little bit about the dangers or the precedents that that sets? Yeah, it's a super slippery slope, isn't it? <laughs> you know, if you're going to shut up the, uh, the KKK, um, what happens to the eco-socialists? Um, I, I don't know what the answer is to that. It, it, we don't have a, a robust or effective federal communications commission, just as we don't have any real good regulatory agencies from the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or as we call it, the Federal uh, Energy Rubber Stamp <clears throat> Corporation. Um, and and uh, the FAA, you know, there are no really good. The EPA, they're all they're all corrupted in some way. Um, so I and and the people making these decisions are just they could be anybody. You know, they could be any one of us on this call. They could be um, you know people who are members of the KKK. They could be military people. We don't know who's who's working for these Spotify and uh, others that are making the call. So I, I don't have a good answer for that. I think it's a terrifying prospect. I think it's also a terrifying prospect if we don't have some kind of controls. Um, and that comes down to who's making the decisions. It's just like who's sitting on the Supreme Court. These are the arbiters of, <laughs> of what's just in our country. And, and not just the Supreme Court, but every district court, every local court. You know, We have local courts where you don't even have to have a high school education to be passing judgment on others. Um, so I'm sorry, it's not a very good answer. The system is broken and, you know, we need system change on, on every level and that's just, just one more. I'm sorry, I can't give a better answer. I'm sure someone <clears throat> more familiar might be able to come up with something more glib, but I don't, I don't really think there is a good answer. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh Plenty more topics and questions. Another one, uh, the previous question from Mary F was from uh, New York State Home of Rackbusters. So I figured I would let you know that there's someone out there from, from New York tuning in. Um, this one comes from L Keller. What are your suggestions on countering the vilification of science and scientists in the media? Oh, that's that's uh, a really good one. Actually, it's it's heartbreaking for scientists to be um, uh, it, to be um, made into the evildoers that that the right wing is trying to uh, to, to make them into. I mean, with the medical profession and and um, especially right now, the medical profession is really under attack, and they're the people who are saving lives. Um, the only way that that would ever change is if the right-wing media were to be suddenly uh, not powerful, but they seem to be growing more and more powerful. And unless we all really stop even looking at them, and, and <clears throat> I think there are enough of us, to, if we were to stop look, it's very hard to look away, right? It was like during the last tweeter in chief, Every morning, everybody got up and looked at the the news. What did a a head say overnight? You know, what new outrage has been perpetrated? And we, you know, just like um, Moonves, the head of CBS in in those days, said, you know, he may be really bad for the country, but he's damn good for CBS. Um, the you know we as long as we tune in, <clears throat> as long as we continue to tune in and to give these things credence, and even to be outraged about them on social media. They're get, the more they're mentioned, <clears throat> it's free advertising. The more they're mentioned, the more strength they get, the more powerful they get, the more their uh, search engine optimization is strengthened. So I, I think the most important thing is to tune out rather than to even be outraged by it. Just don't listen, don't pay attention. 
and do the do the same throughout your uh, circles. If you can talk people into understanding that the more they pay attention, the more powerful the enemy grows. The enemy just continues eating it up, and 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 it's all protein to the enemy. So that's the best I can say. Um, you know, we're not. We are enough. There are enough of us. We just can't tear ourselves away. You know, it's why, why the local news highlights murders and rapes and violence against children and women, especially. These things are apparently are titillating to a large majority of the population and we just can't tear our eyes away. But we, we need to, we need to because the real raping and pillaging and destruction is happening to us while we're doing it and we're allowing it. So that goes, that's true for scientists as well as everybody else. We're, we're all susceptible to the lure of this lurid stuff. Those are, those are great points. Um, there's one question that I actually had more on something that I'm been increasingly curious about is um, why the corporate media can't, or when they do report on whistleblowers like Julian Assange, uh, Chelsea Manning, it's often vilifying them, even though their their journalism is, you know, kind of the journalism that's holding power accountable, and it should be the journalism that's championed rather than vilified. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you think that these corporate media institutions don't champion people like Julian Assange? And maybe talk a little bit about what Julian Assange has accomplished, who might not be familiar. Well, um, Julian Assange is, is, to my mind, a great hero. He's been, uh, oh my God, he's been so horrifically abused personally and in the media that he has been a champion of that it's it's hard to even wrap your head around how bad it is and how few people are paying attention. Um, as the founder and uh, publisher of, of WikiLeaks, he exposed the wrongdoing of the United States military